Welcome back, historians, and let's buckle right back in. We're still in the middle of a hectic time here in South America. Revolutions continue to bloom across the continent, offering us more stories of infant nations and heroic liberators rising from the rubble of Europeans' colonial empire in Sudamerica. Last time, we learned the story of El Libertador, Simón Bolívar, whose Continental Army succeeded in expelling the Spanish from the Viceroyalty of Nueva Granada, but who had a bit more difficulty leading the massive experimental republic known as Gran Colombia. However, Bolívar was not the only Creole with revolutionary intentions, nor Nueva Granada the only region yearning for autonomy from Spain. Today we'll continue our journey down the Cordillera of the Andes to acquaint ourselves with the independence movements of other Latin American countries. But don't be surprised if El Libertador makes a surprise appearance. Here are our guiding questions. How were the Spanish vice royalties organized in Latin America and what primed them for revolution? What role did José de San Martín play in the liberation of future nations within Rio de la Plata? What can the first years of Peruvian independence teach us about some of the initial challenges of newly formed governments in Latin America? And our big picture question for today, who is qualified to lead a revolution? Before we launch straight into revolutionary leaders and battles, let's take a moment to understand how Spain organized their colonial possessions and how it laid the groundwork for future liberation movements. Spanish colonial holdings in Latin America were organized into virenatos, or vice royalties. Each vice royalty was governed by a vire, or viceroy, who exercised power over the region on behalf of the Spanish crown. A vice royalty served a variety of purposes, but its primary goal was to ensure the Spanish crown profited handsomely from the extraction of natural resources all over the colonies. For the first 200 years of Spain's colonization, two vice royalties controlled all of the empire's conquered territories. Nueva España, or New Spain, included all of Spain's North American territories as well as some of Central America. The Viceroyalty of Peru controlled all of Spain's South American colonies, which was a huge expanse of land that would have covered the entire continent if it wasn't for their colonial neighbor. Brazil, a Portuguese colony, spanned almost half the South American continent and made the Spanish crown anxious as it threatened to expand southward across the Plata River and into Spanish territory. Coupled with the threat of Britain's formidable naval forces in the Atlantic, the Spanish crown responded to the looming Portuguese threat by severing parts of the Viceroyalty of Peru to form the Viceroyalty of Nueva Granada along the Atlantic coast in 1717, and Rio de la Plata alongside the Plata River in 1776. With Buenos Aires as its capital, Rio de la Plata spanned the areas that make up modern-day Bolivia, Paraguay, Uruguay, and Argentina. Although Spain had created Rio de la Plata to quell any worries along the Brazilian border, its earliest years were defined by civil unrest and political instability. For example, between 1780 and 1782, it witnessed a violent uprising of 100,000 indigenous, mestizo, and criollo people who, under the command of indigenous cacique Tupac Amaru II, demanded an end to the unjust and racist labor policies. Although the Spanish crown eventually captured and executed Tupac, anti-colonial sentiments like these simmered throughout the Viceroyalty for years to come. These sentiments were exacerbated when Creoles and Rio de la Plata managed to fend off two different British invasions at the onset of the 19th century without any Spanish support. The rumblings for independence grew louder as many Creoles realized maybe they could do a better job of protecting and governing themselves than the Spanish could. Also adding fuel to the revolutionary flames was Portugal's decision to move its royal court to Brazil in 1807 as a result of the Peninsular War. This left some to suspect that the British might be planning a third invasion, this time with Portuguese support. All of this is to say that the Rio de la Plata was primed for a change. How were the Spanish vice royalties organized in Latin America and what primed them for revolution?
A revolutionary powder keg waiting to blow, Rio de la Plata just needed one spark. So when 1810 rolled around, they didn't just get one spark, but two. The first came as an indirect gift from Napoleon, who at the time had overrun Spain during the Peninsular War. This meant Spain wasn't exactly prepared when Creoles in Buenos Aires pounced on the opportunity to remove the Viceroy of Rio de la Plata during what we now call the May Revolution. Not only were the Spanish dealing with a foreign threat in their own backyard, but they were now faced with two uprisings as our friend Simon Bolivar led another group of revolutionary Creoles up north who had just kicked off the Venezuelan War for Independence. The May Revolution would eventually morph into the Argentine War for Independence, which would last from 1810 to 1816. One officer who emerged as a key leader in Argentina's independence movement was José de San Martín. Born into a Creole family in present-day Argentina, San Martín was sent to Spain to study when he was just seven years old. He would go on to spend 20 years in the Spanish military, even fighting against Napoleon's forces in the Peninsular War before eventually becoming a lieutenant colonel. But in 1811, he abruptly resigned from the Spanish army, and by 1812, he had appeared in Argentina and was already leading armed Argentine forces against the Spanish. His return had a huge impact. After defeating Spanish forces at San Lorenzo, he turned his sights to Lima and the Viceroyalty of Peru, which he believed was the key to liberating all of Spanish America. After creating the Army of the Andes, he led forces across the mountain range into Chile, where he would partner with Chilean military captain Bernardo O'Higgins to help liberate Chile from Spanish rule in 1818, just a couple of years after Argentina had declared its independence in 1816. Who was José de San Martín and what role did he play in the liberation of future nations within Rio de la Plata? After the liberation of Chile, San Martín sailed to Peru and finally seized control of Lima in 1821. Unlike Chile, however, Peru had no local politicians of the stature of O'Higgins, who became supreme director of Chile. So San Martín was quickly appointed protector of Peru. Soon after, he traveled to Guayaquil to meet with Simón Bolívar, who was still in the process of liberating the rest of Ecuador. What was shared between the two is up for debate as there were no witnesses or notes of the meeting. Some historians believe that the two leaders might have disagreed on how to govern the newly formed republics, with San Martín calling for a constitutional monarchy while Bolívar preferred a republic. Regardless, after the meeting, San Martín renounced his protectorship and gave control of his forces to Bolívar, who would go on to liberate the rest of northern Peru in 1824, which was named Bolivia in his honor. San Martín retreated from political and military life, eventually moving back to France, where he would spend the rest of his days until his death in 1850. Today, San Martín is regarded as a great liberator and hero of Argentina, Chile, and Peru. Alongside Bolívar, he is seen as one of the great liberators of Spanish South America, and the Order of the Liberator General San Martín is still the highest honor that the Argentine government can bestow upon a person. Newly established, Peru now faced a bevy of challenges as it sought to establish itself as a nation. Although politically independent, the country was still economically dependent on Spain. Not only that, it had inherited centuries of discriminatory policies toward the indigenous peoples of the region, whose lands continued to be plundered by the newly formed government. In fact, indigenous peoples would not even be granted citizenship until 1861. There you have it, the whirlwind of independence movements that shook Spanish South America and laid the foundations of many of the countries we recognize in Latin America today. Let's finish with a quick review. What can the first years of Peruvian independence teach us about some of the initial challenges of newly formed governments in Latin America? Next time, we'll be traveling north to a region that might feel a little closer to home for some of us, Mexico. Until then, keep your eyes and ears open for the next revolution because history is everywhere. Hey.